And then I had this piece by Jonathan Chait in New Yorker magazine, which is also really sort of just, this is pathetic. It's pathetic. Actually, let's hear more from Dick Cheney on Iraq. Let's hear him out before we laugh at him. But but Chait is actually making another argument. What do liberals believe about the current disaster in Iraq? One thing most of us believe is the United States should stay the hell out. But, among, but another thing liberals believe with even greater conviction is that the advocates of the last Iraq war should not participate in the current debate. I would go further. If we want to hear from Dick Cheney, we should be seeing, we should be talking to him through a three-inch plate glass window. And he should be on one of those telephone things. In an orange jumpsuit. So Chait makes this, 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 there's a little bit of a straw man. It's not just about that we should not, they should not participate in the current debate. It's that they should be held accountable. Advocates of the shut the hell of up uh, have different ideas for who should be placed within the cone of silence. James Fallows would include all 2003 advocates of, of war, a sweeping group that would include me, uh, writes Jonathan Chait, Fred Kaplan, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, not to mention a handful of Fallows colleagues. Others seem to have in mind only members of the Bush administration. The most frequent justification for shut the hell up is, quote, accountability. There should be a price for being wrong. I supported the war in 2003, Chait writes, which I now regret. And it's entirely reasonable to think more skeptically about my arguments. In parentheses, he says, I do. I consciously decide to write less frequently about foreign policy as a result. But the shut the hell up advocates aren't making a generalized case for retroactively scrutinizing the arguments made by politicians and public intellectuals. They're arguing for accountability applied to the singular event of the 2003 Iraq war. See, this is where he's going to split hairs now. You see where he's going with this? We don't hold people accountability, uh, accountable for being wrong about all issues. Just the Iraq 2003 war which I happen to have gotten wrong, Chait says. And he says, we don't even hold most people account for being wrong about other wars. He goes on, most Democrats in Congress opposed the Gulf War. This is Gulf War I. Warning of Saddam Hussein's fearsome World War I-style fortifications and citing 45,000 body bags as an indication of the likely U.S. death toll. Predictions that turned out to be wildly incorrect. Why shouldn't anti-Gulf War Democrats, that is, the vast majority of Democrats, have been excluded from subsequent foreign policy debates? If your answer is because people died, dash Iraq, then you're not arguing the pro-war arguments should be ignored because they're analytically wrong. You're arguing they should be ignored because they're inherently morally suspect, regardless of accuracy. You see the game and Chait is playing here. Because there's two things that he's ign willfully ignoring. And ignoring in one part, particularly about himself. It is that A, people who argued on a policy level against this 2003 war were demonized. Demonized in a way that those people who argued for Gulf War I we're never demonized by people like Jonathan Chait, by the establishment media, by the so-called liberal hawks. And B, the costs of this war were so greater than the mistake, the mistake and the lies, frankly. But if you want to just say, let's take it for, uh, um, given the benefit of the doubt, the mistake was so costly and it was so clear that it was so costly that Chait has to prove the counterfactual that had we not attacked in Gulf War I and just let 
Kuwait be semi-occupied by Iraq, that the cost of that would have been as great as the cost of going into Iraq in the first place. And you have to account for the fact that there were weapons inspectors on the ground. I mean, this is the two-step that he's pushing here. This is part of his reformation. It really is. And it's just as disingenuous as it was during 2003. The cost of being wrong was much greater. The smearing that went went on was much greater. The level of skepticism that you have when going into a war should be much greater. But all that is just wiped away with this sort of smugness. Chait should abide by his own edict to himself and stay out of it. He should, in fact, shut the hell up. Because this is pathetic. This is one of the worst pieces of garbage he's written. And he's written some bad pieces. He's written some decent one, too. But this is bad. This is really bare-knuckled. If you're going to make this argument, buddy, you've got to spend a little more time on it. Then equating the implications of, be, of, of, of predicting greater casualties... Versus predicting stability and democracy and safety and security. I mean, this is just absurd. It's just absurd. Yeah, you know, uh, some people actually ordered on a menu... And uh, they think they're going to like the chicken better than the fish. They ended up not liking the chicken better than the fish. So maybe we should also discount their opinions on the on the Iraq war as well. You might as well say that. Because we know the consequences. Of mistaken predictions. That attacking Saddam Hussein in Gulf War One versus invading and occupying Iraq in the second Gulf War. And in fact, I would also say that to the extent that world, the first Gulf War encouraged us to go into Iraq the second time, those people who were arguing against going into the Gulf War the first time probably had a pretty good point. Because I don't think that in 2003 it's as easy to invade that country in terms of the body politic if you don't have Gulf War I. But that's just, I don't know, that's just sort of the the cranberry sauce on this meal of uh, BS that Jonathan Shade is pushing. 